morning, everyone. The love of God welcomes us. The grace of Christ awaits us. The joy of the Spirit enfolds us. The love of God emboldens us. The grace of Christ redeems us. The joy of the Spirit uplifts us. The love of God overflows our hearts. The grace of Christ liberates our spirits. The joy of the Spirit sings in our minds. Don't come as slaves. Come as the truly free. Don't come as outsiders. Come as much wanted children. Come as the joyful. Come as the eager. Come as the thankful. Come as those who have received his amazing grace. Come, let us worship our God together. Shall we look to God in prayer? Most gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is the day that you have made. This is the day that you have called holy, Make us glad this morning, O Master, as we are here in your house, the house of the Lord. Remove from us our distractions, the worries of our heart, and all the things that stress and strain us, our to-dos and should-haves. And in its place, O God, give us more of yourself. Here in your house, O oh Master, fill our hearts with your peace. Fill us to brimming and overflowing with your joy, the joy of our Lord. Make us to be your people. Mold us to be more like Jesus. Have your way in us, Holy Father. And as we choose to decrease, may you delight to increase in us. Help us to be your loving body, your loving and living body. In our prayers, songs, reading and listening, we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Saviour, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals to hymn number 20 as we hum along with the music, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Hymn number 20 in our hymnals.
Good morning. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the Sherman Church, especially our quarantine people. So glad to have you all back with us. And welcome to everyone who is worshiping online on our live stream. Um, we have uh, all, of course, all of our services are always online at our website, shermanchurch.org. You can look at them at any time if you have to miss a service when it's actually on. And Jen Bundy's children's stories are uh, still on hiatus at the moment, but you can look at past stories if you haven't seen them. Um, I have a lot of announcements today. It's very exciting. Um, I just want to remind you, Bible study at the Oratory of the Little Way, uh, the, the last one for this session is this Wednesday at 10 a.m. via Zoom. And their Founders Day program is today from 2 to 3 with live music, song, and sacred stories outdoors, $10 per person. I don't think you had to register ahead of time, but I'm not sure. You can go to their website. You didn't, yeah, you could, you could just go. But before that, we, uh, are, the deacons, are inviting our congregation to join the Holy Hikers, if you all remember our group, the Holy Hikers. We're having a group hike at the Great Hollow Nature Preserve in New Fairfield. Uh, we're going to meet in the parking area at noon after the service today. The parking area, I think they mean of Great Hollow, right? Not here, yes. We're not going over in a caravan or anything like that. Uh, you should bring a mask, wear sturdy shoes, comfortable clothing, bring a snack or lunch uh, and water with you, and of course, we'll be socially distanced, but it'll be outside. Uh, Great Hollow is located uh, at 222 Route 37 South. The driveway is right before the turn onto Haviland, Haviland Hollow Road, going into New York Route 22, if you're coming from Sherman coming from New Fairfield, it's just after that turn. And you can go to their website in case the directions aren't quite clear. And another exciting event that we have coming up is uh, we are going to have a prayer walk here Sunday, October 18th, right after the worship service. We will leave from here and walk along Church Road. We will uh, pray for the people in the neighborhood as we go. We're not going to stop at any homes. We're not going to leave anything for anybody, but we're going to pray for them, for each other, for the Sherman community. And even though this is an outreach of our missions committee, it is also inspired by our health team and our prayer warriors. And really it was Cindy Mishita's idea. So this is quite exciting, I think, for our church. And please invite any friends to join us if you uh, know of people who might wanna come. Uh, we're going to have a handout describing the walk that will be available the Sunday before and the day of the walk, so you sort of you sort of know what we're going to be doing. And the rain date will be the following Sunday, rain or hurricane or snowstorm. I don't know what we might get, so uh, it'll be October 25th. But we're going to be praying for good weather. Um, we would like you to RSVP to Glory at the church office because uh, at at info at shermanchurch.org, which I don't know if you realize that's our new. Um, email address, um, because if we have a large group, we will probably go to some different neighborhoods, like three people at a time, and uh, we will figure out those neighborhoods ahead of time. Um, otherwise, if it's a small group, we will just walk down Church Road. And I'm holding my little uh, visual aid here. As you know, we've started Operation Christmas Child, and there are uh, shoe boxes, these kind of boxes, at, at, right in the narthex with, don't forget the little brochure that tells you exactly what you can give. But if for some reason you aren't able to um, do anything, pick anything up, you're not here today, uh, you can go to our website and we have a link to Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child, that gives you all the information. Uh, also, don't forget about Tuesday Bible study. Now we have two disciples left, yes, that we're studying, uh, 6.30 p.m. on Google Meet, and uh, Thursday prayer in the parlor is still continuing. You can call into that any Thursday at 6.30 p.m. also, and if you have a prayer concern, you can submit it at the prayer tab um, on, the, on the website. So I think that's all. Pretty exciting. Thank you and welcome. So this is the time in our service where we offer up our prayers to the Lord. Um, please speak and I will try to repeat it for the folks that are joining online as best I can. And um, the Lord does hear our prayers and he's uh, 
more anxious to bless us than we are to ask. So please ask him for what's in your heart. Dear Father in heaven, what a privilege it is that we can come before you with our prayers, with our praise, with our adoration of you, with our requests of you, Lord. We thank you that you are a gracious Father and that you allow us to come into your presence as your children. Please, God, hear our prayers. Prayers for Sandy Coochie, who was battling cancer, a May's friend. Prayers for Sue's mom, Carol, for continued healing for her. And thank you, God, for the healing so far. Father, I lift up our daughter, Carolyn, to you. I know you said it's for a good thing. God, she's doing fairly well with her for the last month of pregnancy. And um, Lord, for a personal touch of healing, right here. Prayers for Don and Edna's daughter, Carol, who was uh, in her last stage of pregnancy, and we're praying for a healthy delivery for that baby and for her to be healthy as well. Prayers for Amelia, Ken, and Cindy's daughter that she does not have COVID, and for for Joan Mashita, who is in hospice. Prayers for Enoch Alamany's soul and for Tara and her family and extended family, Lord, and for Chris Freeman, for Chris Freeman's mom uh, and her health issues, Lord. Dear Lord, we, I lift up Kim Pache to you. Please give her strength at the loss of Larry, her, her husband of 38 years. And I pray, Lord, for his soul to be in your hands. And I pray for comfort for her and for his family at this time. Dear Lord, we also lift up the nation to you. 
we thank you for Franklin Graham's uh, work for to work the church to bring unity into this country and uh, positive change, Lord. And we just lift up our leaders. We ask you, Lord, that they govern rightly and justly and fairly and that they do their jobs responsibly. Uh, dear Lord, I just lift up this nation to you at this time for healing in our hearts and in our minds, Lord. And we are in your hands, Lord, you are sovereign. And we thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. And most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died to save us for eternity. In Jesus' name, we all pray, amen. Please rise for the Old Testament lesson. Uh, the Old Testament lesson is found in Judges chapter 16, verses 23 to 30, found on page 251 of your Pew Bibles. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their god and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O oh, sovereign Lord, remember me. O oh God, please strengthen me just once more and let me get one blow, with one blow, get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Um, the New Testament lesson is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 17, found on page 1202 of your Pew Bibles. Finally, all of you, Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good he must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to do harm to you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. This ends the New Testament lesson.
The gospel lesson is found in Luke chapter 6, verses 26 to 36, found on page 1021 of your pew Bibles. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is the word of our Lord. Kindly be seated. Let's turn in our hymnals to hymn number 704. Hymn number 704. There's a story that some of you may know. It's about some officers during the the Korean conflict. These officers rented a house for themselves and they hired a a Korean boy to do work for them, to do their laundry, their cleaning, and their cooking. And this boy was a cheerful, happy soul. And the officers were young and they had a lot of fun playing tricks on this uh, Korean boy. So the officers would nail his shoes to the floor. They would short sheet his bed. They put buckets of water up over the door so that when this boy pushed it open, the water and the bucket, you know, fell on him. And the boy, he always took it with such grace and good humor that after a while, These officers, they started feeling kind of embarrassed and ashamed of themselves. So one day, they called this boy in and they said, you know, we've been doing all these mean things to you and you've taken it so beautifully. We just want to apologize to you and tell you that we are never ever going to do these things again. We are never ever going to do those things again. So the boy said, You mean no more nailing shoes to the floor? And the officer said, no, no more. The boy said, no more buckets over door? They said, no, no more. Okay then, the boy said, no more spit in soup. No more spit in soup. Revenge. Sweet. Revenge. I mean, who here has not 
done something similar. I mean, not exactly that, but who here has not done something similar or even fantasized about getting even? I mean, even if we are the most peace-loving people in the world, we all default to our human nature sometime or the other, right? As we finish off our series on loving unmasked next Sunday, we are now coming to some of the most difficult expressions or outworkings of love. You know, as Christians, we are all called to love one another. That's, we, that's what we read in our Bibles. That's what we've been taught all along. And we say that we do love. We do love, right? But Paul has been teaching us from this passage what it actually means to love. Love in practical ways. What, what does that entail as a church, as a body of believers? And for today, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, and we are looking at verse 14 and verses 17 and 18. So this is what Paul says. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is where the rubber meets the road. Here, you know, in these, uh, in these three verses, we find some of the, the most impossible demands of love that are upon us as, as Christians. Now, let me try and help you experience the first impossibility of these three verses. Uh, would you do a, a little exercise with me? Could you all please close your eyes? Could you all please close your eyes? Everyone, even those you know, who are watching us on the live stream, if you could just close your eyes. And now, imagine the face of someone you dislike. Now I know that you all are very good people and you love everyone, but think of someone you love a little less. Someone you struggle to love. Think of someone probably you hate. Someone who has wronged you. Someone who has hurt you. Someone who did something really bad to you. I'll give you a few seconds to form that picture of that person, of that lucky person in your mind. And now as you can see that face clearly in front of you, I want you to silently take their name and bless them. Can you silently take their name and bless them? Okay. Now was that easy? Ah, I'm not going to even ask how difficult that was. If you're human, I know that it was difficult. So that's our first dilemma. The impossibility of blessing those who persecute me. Paul writes, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And this is exactly what you know, Jesus also says in our gospel lesson and what Peter also uh, mentions you know, in his epistle that was read out to us. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, being the good people that we are, we may not curse anyone, right? 
I mean, although there's a certain freedom when we went out, right? If at all, you know, any of us like, or any of us dislikes or hates, how would you, how would you like these words? How, I mean, how do these words sound, especially for those people whom we hate, whom we dislike? Listen to these words. Let their supper be bait in a trap that snaps shut. May their best friends be trappers who'll skin them alive. Make them become blind as bats. Give them the shakes from morning to night. Let them know what you think of them. Blast them with your red hot anger. Burn down their houses. Leave them desolate with nobody at home. Pile on the guilt. Don't let them off the hook. How did that sound to the person whom you imagined? Now, where do you think I got that from? That was Eugene Peterson's The Message, paraphrasing the words of King David in Psalm 69, verses 22 to 27. And David ends, uh, you know, in verse 28 by saying, May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. Now, I'm not trying to show you the bad side of David. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm only saying that we are just like David. We are just like David, only not probably as descriptive as David is, you know, in some of these imprecatory psalms. You know, the language that he uses, some of us may go red, you know, when we, when we read them. See, today, when we pray for those who are persecuting Christians, when we pray for places, you know, where dictators are ruling, when we plead with God to end violence, fighting, what are we doing? Aren't we essentially asking God to judge justly? Aren't we asking God to judge justly? Aren't we asking God to intervene and fight for the oppressed? Now don't get me wrong. I'm not asking you to go home and search out these imprecatory psalms and use them in your prayers against those people whom you pictured in your mind. No. Again, what I'm trying to say is that it's so easy for us to curse. It's easier for us to wish harm on someone we dislike. It's easier for us to take revenge or to at least fantasize about getting even compared to blessing those who persecute us. It's more difficult for us to bless than to curse. It's more easier for us to repay back and to get even rather than doing, you know, that impossible uh, demand of love to bless and not to curse and to not repay back evil for evil. You see, this is a demand of love that not just restrains our hands from doing evil, but it also sort of checks our bitter feelings, our own personal feelings towards those who unjustly trouble us, to those who may persecute us and seek our destruction. It's very difficult to practice that, right? It's kind of impossible. How can we do that? I'll come to that at the end. Now, in verse 17, Paul continues by saying, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And here is the second dilemma. It's the paradox 
you know of being careful to do right what is right in the eyes of everyone it's it's a paradox let me explain this see we just saw that god expects us to bless those who persecute us god expects us to bless and not curse and to not repay anyone evil for evil and now paul is saying be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone so what is right in the eyes of everyone when someone does something bad to us what is right in the eyes of everyone when someone does something bad to you what does the world say the world says get even get even see it's almost universal the tendency to strike back to retaliate to try to get even to make that evil do a pay for the harm that he or she has done to us it's it's universal it's everywhere it's there in the united states it's there in india it's there everywhere you go what is right in the eyes of everyone when someone hurts you or cheats you what is right what does the world tell us what does society tell us sue them take them to court to teach them a lesson we are living in such a litigious society that will even sue us when we have not done anything wrong so what can we expect if we do wrong what is right in the eyes of everyone if i wish harm or curse in my own personal heart what is right in the eyes of everyone the world says by all means hey what you do in your own time and in your own space and in your own heart is perfectly all right in fact even if you express a little bit of that hatred in your heart it can be justified it can be justified now what is right in the eyes of the world is very different from what the world expects from us christians what is right in the eyes of the world for themselves is very different from what the world expects to see in us christians the world is so quick to notice that we christians do not conform to a certain standard and they are even quicker to sort you know when we do not live up to that standard they are even you know quick to mock us and you even mock our lord jesus because we do not live up to that standard the world will never hold these high moral standards for themselves and they will never let go of an opportunity to judge us if we fail from what they expect to see in us and so is paul telling us that we should always do what is right or we should always do what the other people or the world considers to be good and right is paul teaching us to always look good on the outside by doing things that the world sees as right and good is that what paul is trying to te- teach us now let me try and combine these both and what paul tells in verse 18 in in an example of a person if you want a very good example of someone who did whatever he saw as right and good if you want an example of someone who did exactly what he saw as right and good if you want the best example of someone who died getting their revenge then it is the one who you know we read about in our old testament reading from judges chapter 16 samson samson now samson he always did what was right in his eyes in fact you know in some ways the problem was always with his eyes 
Now we all know that Samson, Samson was extremely strong, extremely strong. But he was also a man of peace. Samson was also a man of peace. I thought that would wake some of you up. I said Samson was a man of peace, not P-E-A-C-E. -E. He was a man of peace, P-I-E-C-E. -E. He always gave a piece of himself. He always gave a piece of himself, his mind and his muscle to everyone. If you read the story of Samson in the Old Testament, you see that connection between his eyes and his heart, the eyes and his actions, the outworkings of the heart. And the first thing that is recorded about Samson when he grew up, you know, if you could go back home and read, you know, the story of Samson, um, you know, it's fascinating. The first thing that is recorded when Samson grew up in Judges 14.1, is that Samson went down to Timnah and he saw there a young Philistine woman. Did you notice that? Starts with his eyes. He saw there a young Philistine woman and he came home and he told his parents, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. A Philistine woman for a Jew, for a Nazarite. Now, when you have a son who's as strong as Samson, you don't argue much. <laughs> so the marriage was arranged. But Samson, you know, in the, in the course of that marriage, Samson asked a riddle to the Philistines uh, and they couldn't answer it. And, you know, those, uh, the one who lost the riddle had to pay, you know, 30 uh, sets of clothes to the one you know, who won. And so these Philistines, they were going to have to pay a huge sum, you know, to, uh, if Samson won, and they did not know the answer to this riddle. So, the Philistine threatened Samson's bride to get the answer. And finally they got it, and they gave the right answer to Samson. In his anger, Samson, he went to the neighboring town, he struck down 30 men and he got their clothes to pay his end of the bargain because they had answered, uh, you know, the riddle. Samson's bride and, you know, Samson in his anger went off. Samson's bride was given to another man. And when Samson returned back, he got to know that, you know, his bride had been given to someone else. And now he wanted to get even. He wanted to get even. And what did he do? He tied the tails of 300 foxes in pairs. He lit up those tails and he set those foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. Total destruction of everything that they had toiled for. Gone. Just to get his revenge. And then, he didn't stop at that. It, you know, in order to get his revenge, he attacked and viciously slaughtered many of the Philistines. At one time, using the jawbone of a donkey, he even struck down a thousand men as he burned to get even. And then, Samson's eyes fell on Delilah. And ultimately, she shaved off Samson's hair and she shaved off his miraculous strength also. The Philistines captured Samson and they made him blind. They took off his eyes. They gouged out his eyes. In the end, what did Samson do? He sought revenge for his eyes. He sought revenge for his eyes. And in his vengeful death, he killed many more than when he had lived. The example of, of Samson, you know, even if it was possible for him, it was possible for him to be peaceable, but he did not because he did what was right in his eyes. 
peace depended on him. He could have kept the peace. But no, Samson had no peace. He was not a man of peace. Now next Sunday, in contrast to this, we're going to look at someone who was wronged much, much more than Samson. Someone who was treated unjustly, who was persecuted, but yet, you know, their response was something else. And I'm not talking about Jesus, but a type of Jesus. But please keep this example of Samson in mind now. And now let's look at Romans 12, 18, where Paul writes, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Paul is calling us over there to be a people of peace. A people of peace who will seek and pursue peace. But he also gives two qualifications over there. It's not just, just peace, you know, pursue peace or live at peace with everyone. There are two qualifications. It says, if it is possible if it is possible now there can be sometimes where peace is impossible uh, for example Hebrews 12 14 uh, it says make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy without holiness no one will see the Lord so you know that verse is basically telling us that yes make every effort to be to live at peace so pursue peace but also pursue sanctification. Be holy. So you cannot give up the holiness part in order to maintain the peaceful part. For peace without holiness is not real peace. If if we have to maintain, if, you know, if we have to maintain the peace by giving up holiness, any part of holiness, then that peace, you know, it's not possible. So there's a connection between holiness and peace. And I'll just come to that. But secondly, the second qualification that Paul gives is, as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, be a people of peace. See, there are situations that require, at times, the sacrifice of peace. When we have done everything that we can do for peace, you know, it is always the other person also who needs to be willing. Now, if the other person is not willing to have peace except on some conditions, which as Christians we are unable to accept, then you see, we cannot have peace. As far as it depends on you. As far as it depends on you. Now, we, have, we may have known people of peace. We may have known people who have won even the Nobel Peace Prize. But peace, true peace, is a fruit. Is a fruit of the Spirit. As far as it depends on you, does peace depend on you? Yes, it does. And I told you there's a connection between holiness and peace. Because first, if you want to have real peace, it has to start between us making peace with God. We are all sinners. We are all sinners. And there is a just punishment for our sins. That is death. Death. Now God has paid the price. Jesus has taken our place. He has paid that price by dying on the cross. But all that we need to do is to make peace with God first. The demands that he has are met by Jesus. We just need to accept that for ourselves. We have to accept Jesus and what he has done for ourselves. Have you done that? Have you made Jesus your Lord? Have you made your peace with God?
are your sins forgiven that's where it starts and it is possible it depends on you true peace with others follows from this because see once we have made our peace with god and then when we start loving god when we start loving the prince of peace it is then that we will be peacemakers it is then that we can make peace with others so it all starts with making our peace first with god and then we'll be able to truly bless even bless those who persecute us the first impossibility becomes possible if we are a people of peace first peace with god and let his peace rule in our hearts it is then that we can truly bless others even those who persecute us because that's what the prince of peace our lord did even to the ones who crucified him he said father forgive them he loved he loved and he continues to love doesn't he we all of us are examples of that he continues to love us when we have god's peace ruling in our hearts it is then that we are able to not repay back evil for evil then that impossibility becomes a possibility because of god and be- being a people of peace will also help us to be careful to do what is right and good in the eyes of everyone there was a paradox right you see the the goodness or the good that paul talks about there you know there's a difference between that that's a that's a goodness from the outside you know when paul says be careful to do what is right and good in the eyes of everyone it's an external goodness but that external goodness depends on the goodness from the inside the outward expression of an inward goodness that is what god that is what paul is talking about that is the demand of love that god has upon us first begins with the internal peace the internal goodness that only god can bring about in our lives let me close with this illustration jim walton he was translating the new testament for the munin people of la sabana in the jungles of colombia but he was having trouble translating that word peace he didn't know what to do couldn't find that word for peace during that time the village chief fernando he was promised a 20 minute plane ride to a location that would take him 3 days to travel by walking now on that day when the plane was supposed to arrive to take this chief on his first plane ride the plane was delayed and so this chief being the chief that he was he just set off on foot when the plane finally arrived a runner took off to bring the chief back to the plane now the time the chief by the time the chief returned the plane had left so you see that mess now chief fernando he was livid he was angry because of this mix up and he went to jim walton and he started yelling he started yelling now fortunately jim walton he taped and he recorded the chief's angry you know all the angry words that he used in his anger later when jim translated it he discovered that the that the chief kept repeating the phrase i don't have one heart i don't have one heart heart and jim asked the other villagers what having one heart meant and he found that it was like saying there is nothing between you and the other person 
there is nothing between you and the other person that jim realized was what he needed to translate that word peace peace begins when there's nothing between us and god peace begins when there's nothing between us and god we have one heart with god nothing is held back nothing separates us no pride no sin no guilt we have one heart and then then when we have one heart we can trust him we can trust him because you know we are freed to trust him even in those situations you know where we can have confidence because he is sovereign he is sovereign in those situations and we are free to act as his children to express mercy and grace to us others who persecute us that's the demand of love let's close our eyes let's bow down our heads is there something between you and god have you made your peace with god or have you held back is our pride our sin our guilt what is separating you and god make your peace with god first and then ask him to help you to pursue peace to seek that peace and to live for the prince of peace in doing that we'd be able to meet the demands of love can each of us say a prayer in our own hearts Our most gracious God we thank you oh master that you love us with a love that we cannot really understand we do not deserve your love oh god we are in no way good in your standards of good you still choose to love us you still choose you you chose oh god to send your son and to allow him to be crucified and to pay for our sins we thank you god that you did not repay us for our sins but you repaid us in love you made peace between us by giving us jesus and lord we pray that each one of us would be able to make that peace first with you because true peace cannot be cannot be had in any other way and lord as we have that peace as our sins are forgiven as jesus is our lord may we live for the prince of peace and in so doing o oh lord may we be able to bless those who persecute us bless and not curse may we be able to repay not repay them evil for evil but in your way o oh master we just pray and commit ourselves to you help us to understand this and bring us to you o master that we may experience true peace that we may be a people of peace we thank you o father for listening in jesus most precious name we ask and we pray amen
Closing, let us turn in our hymnals to hymn number 710. Hymn number 710. And let's, let's hum all the three verses of this hymn, hymn number 710. We are called to be God's people. for the benediction we have sung the songs of faith we have heard the challenges of love in scripture let us go now continuing our sacred journey in an attitude of service and grace let us not repay anyone evil for evil let us love our enemies and pray for those who harm us. Bless them. Bless those who persecute us. And let us be a people of peace. A people of the Prince of Peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, rest, remain and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen.